This is a well-meaning video, so before you head down to the comments, let me explain to you why no mo may can be a complete load of bull. Don't worry, this thing's not even on. It doesn't even, doesn't even work. However, you might be hearing a strimmer and a mow, which is kind of happening over that way. So every year a trend emerges where we're encouraged to not mow our gardens, not mow our lawns during the month of May. It's a now very popular movement set up by plant life. No mow May. May is arguably the best month of the year where spring transitions into summer, you may get rain, you may get sunshine, everything grows, everything is kick-starting. And for four short weeks, we can experience what it's like when we just do nothing and nature is allowed to come back. And although well-intended, no mo may can be, and kind of is, a real problem. So I just wanna begin by sharing a little story with you. So last year, I was in Exeter, I was making a video about river restoration. I was walking through the city, and when you're making a film, you, you stop and you take in your surroundings, quite literally with the camera. And my ear fell into a conversation of a family passing by. And it went something along the lines of, oh, doesn't that look messy? I, I thought it was only May where we let the grass grow long. Yeah, God, that looks awful. I can't believe they're letting it grow so long. I mean, it was something along those lines. And, you know, I thought to myself in that moment, if this is just one conversation that I happen to be overhearing, what do the rest of people Britain think? And, you know, not to generalise, but if you look across our urban green spaces, if you look across our gardens, you know, our lawns fall somewhere between a regularly mown lawn and, uh, and, and AstroTurf, we kind of look at our, our green landscape and we just expect to see lawns. We expect it to be regularly maintained. The lawn is something which has been ingrained in our culture over the past few hundred years. They really became popular during the 16th and 17th century, and they were a sign of wealth and status because at that time, the only way to maintain a lawn was by hand. So you would have to have had enough money to pay for the manual labor in order to maintain a lawn. And our means of lawn management just continued to progress. First with the cylinder mower invented in the 1830s, then the petrol mower, then harmful pesticides. You know, we made it so that anyone anywhere could have a lawn. And this green tidiness, this need for management just continued to proliferate across our country, you know, gardens, towns and wider landscape. And, you know, really, it just makes me ask the question, why? You know, why do we still do it to this day? Is it because we still see the lawn as a symbol of wealth and status? Or, you know, are we worried that people are going to think that we're messy and untidy? You know, before I did YouTube, before I got into making videos, I was an environmental consultant. And a large part of my time was spent looking at big, dangerous trees in the built environment. Classic case would be you have this massive beech tree that was within falling distance of a road, bus shelter, a primary school. Little kids were at risk of being crushed. So we would investigate the tree and sometimes it would be about, you know, reducing the tree. Sometimes it's about completely felling the tree altogether. What I'm saying is, is that sometimes it is justified. Sometimes there are really rational reasons to manage, you know, our trees and our hedges, but I just feel as though that we've just gone too far. I mean, just take one walk around your town and look at the roadside verges and ask yourself, do we really need to be cutting all of these? Do we need to be cutting all of our lawns? And look, I understand that, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. We all own our own gardens and we can do what we want with them. But I think beyond aesthetics, I think now we need to shift the narrative to being one which is looking after nature and increasing biodiversity wherever we can. And no mow may is a way of doing that. And on the land opposite, you can hear a lawnmower going. It's quite fitting to have that as the backing track for this video. So I'm actually making this video from an area, from a lawn, which is undergoing the no mow may treatment. And you know, how beautiful is it already? We're only two weeks into May and it's just a carpet of daisies. You know, there's, there's other species in there as well. And you know, this is what I think is really awesome about no mow may, just how fast an area can just transform if we let it and you know this is this is turning into a jungle because that's what this is to all the small creatures insects mammals reptiles this is developing into a jungle ecosystem whether we're foraging you know finding shelter this rapid transformation i think is what's really special and important about nomo may because you know i've said this once and i'll say it again humans feel disconnected from nature due to a lack of experience and what nomo may gives us is a chance to experience nature in our own homes, but it's just for four short weeks. So I actually think the biggest problem with Nomo May is really just a breakdown in communication. I think Nomo May as a tagline is just a little bit too good. It's a little bit too specific. 
People think that for one month, they can just let their lawn grow and then come June 1st, oh, let's just whip out the mower, whip out the strimmer and just decimate it back down. If you wanna help wildlife, this really couldn't be worse. This couldn't be a worse situation. It's just like building a house and saying, hey guys, come on, move in, bring your whole family, let's begin to have children. And then, you know what, a couple of weeks later, I'm gonna whip out the wrecking ball and just destroy it, killing everybody inside. Wildlife YouTuber, Joe Ashton, he does wildlife gardening. He's a great guy. He made a video on this recently and he coined the phrase, a no mow summer. If you really wanna help wildlife, you have to do it for longer than just a month because all of those creatures and all of those plants which are moving in, they need more than just a month. It's crazy to think that nature only needs a month in the year in order to survive. A lot of their life cycles need to extend across the whole summer. So how should you do Nomo May to be a little bit more nature friendly? Well, there's a lot of good ways and the guys over at Plant Life, the guys who started the movement, they actually offer a lot of different options on their website because they understand that, you know, everyone has different wants and needs and we all have different sized gardens. And if you did want to cut your lawn on June 1st, at least you would be allowing these flowers to come up, which would be giving pollinating insects something to work with. And you know, it might be enough time for some of these flowers and plants to set seeds so that throughout the year, as you cut it, you have a more abundant and diverse lawn. But if you actually want to help nature this summer, I really recommend against taking out your mowers on June 1st and cutting it all down because you have so many more fun options. You know, I look across this lawn and I'm envisioning a beautiful winding squiggly path that's going through where you can actually like walk through and be a part of this space as it develops into a beautiful wildflower meadow. You know, you could cut sitting areas where you could have picnics in the summer where your kids can play. And, he, and even over there, you could say, you know what? We're gonna do a full-blown rewilding project where we're just gonna let it go completely back to nature. I'm gonna dig a pond, I'm gonna get the beaver in, I'm gonna get some bison in, the wolf, the lynx, the bear. That might be a little bit too extreme for you and I understand that. So perhaps what you could try is just doing one cut a year. Do it at the end of summer once your meadow has had a chance to come up and everything within it has had a chance to live. I just want to zoom out and give you the bigger picture of how I see things here in Britain. We have something like 23 million gardens. We have hundreds of thousands of roadside verges and even more hedgerows. We have such a rich opportunity to see nature return in this country. We just have to let it happen. And I think No Mo May just gives us a glimpse into how that could look and how that could be. So let's build on this momentum that No Mo May gives us and let's see nature return. Please let me know down in the comments what you think about No Mo May. Do you agree with what I'm saying? Do you disagree with what I'm saying? Because look, ultimately I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just here to maybe address some misconceptions and just really advise on what to do if you wanna help nature in your gardens. So I'm currently developing some content around the ideas of small scale rewilding. I'm really excited about it, but a big, a big part of me getting this right is listening to you. So please share with me what you're up to, what are your struggles in your garden. If you want to keep watching the channel, then please check out the video that's on the screen now. But in the meantime, thanks for watching. Live Curious.